sorts of new classes of planets around other stars. We're seeing worlds that are probably made up entirely of water. Some worlds that are probably made up of carbon. Some that are super Earth-like planets that are rocky, that are five or six times Earth mass. Uh, I don't think that, that we, we know enough at this point to really rule out Pluto scientifically as a, as a planet. The controversy came about because of, of the action of the International Astronomical Union that met a few years ago. And they uh, came up with a set of criteria that must be met for a, an object to be classified as a planet. And the criteria were something like this. An object must be in orbit around the sun. It must be large enough that it takes on a nearly round shape, which is met by many trans Neptunian objects. And it must have cleared its orbit of other objects. Well, it turns out that Pluto's orbit intersects the orbit of Neptune. For that reason alone, Pluto was declassified as a planet. If you look at a projection of its orbit and Neptune's orbit, you'll see that Pluto's orbit does intersect the orbit of Neptune. So Pluto has not technically cleared its orbit of other objects. In fact, because of resonance, they, they will never be the same place at the same time. So it's physically impossible for them to even you know, clear each other out of their orbit. Furthermore, as we're learning about other planets around other stars, we're finding some bizarre situations. There's one situation where it appears um, again, the arrow bar is a little bit large. It appears as if there are two gas giant planets in the same orbit in resonance. If we use the IAU definition, then these two gas giant planets are not planets. So the IAU criteria uh, are, are, are incorrect at best and probably a little bit absurd as we start looking at other examples of planets. On the other hand, the question of what constitutes a planet is a very important question because it pertains to the physics that goes into how planets are formed and what determines their structure. I think the idea that a planet must be in orbit around a star is a very legitimate criteria. That it be nearly spherical, I think, is a legitimate criteria. But the criteria that it must have cleared its orbit a degree is so loose that it's not a use, even a useful criteria. And what kind of degree does it have to clear? A grain of dust, plasma, uh, a few asteroids. It's not. It's not obvious how you would, you would put a demar line of demarcation about what it should clear and what it shouldn't. Um, so I think that we've got work to do. Uh, the IAU refused to take up the, the issue again for its controversy. On the other hand, I think it was a really useful controversy. It got all sorts of students interested in Pluto. Why is Pluto? no longer in the, in the Planet Club. Uh, launched January 17, um, 2006. Um, all I can say is that that was a great moment. Um, I started working on, on uh, uh, Pluto in 1980. We had our first international conference on Pluto in 1993. We expect around 75 people. We had 200 people show up in Flagstaff, Arizona. That was the first time, 1993, that we started talking about a mission to Pluto. Uh, I mean, seriously, you know, scoping out what a mission would be like. Um, in 2001, we proposed, we, I was a investigator with a group that proposed a mission to NASA. A uh, competitor group proposed a very similar mission, so NASA just we combined the two missions. We did, we proposed, was accepted in 2003, Built, launched 2006. Um, we're not there yet. We've got three more years to go. And this is a very fast spacecraft. Th this this uh, left Earth at a velocity of about 37,000 miles per hour. Right after the launch, we had a post launch party. You know, been working on this 13 years, so you go and you have a party after you launch. Okay, and this was the party was in Orlando. And then I went, caught a flight from Orlando to Baltimore, came home. By the time I got home, the spacecraft had passed the orbit of the moon. Nine hours. That's how fast it's going. And right now, we are just beyond the orbit of Neptune. We're just now getting there. Now, it's not that we're not doing anything 
along the way. We had all kinds of science operations. We did a slingshot, a gravitational slingshot of Jupiter. Jupiter has a lot of gravity, as you can imagine. This is a picture to scale. The Earth, the great red spot that you know all about, a storm the size of the, the, uh, the Earth. But as we were flying by Jupiter, we got really lucky and captured this volcano on Io. Now, Io is about 1,800 kilometers radius. That's a 300 mile high volcano. So where are we now? Right now, we are about right there. We're just coming up with orbit of Neptune. And we will encounter Pluto uh, in July of 2015. Uh, these two instruments here swap at Pepsi or plasma experiments. This is a, 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 a high-resolution imager. Uh, this is a, a high-resolution infrared spectrometer. This is an ultraviolet spectrometer. And this is a radio science experiment. Um, my role is that I'm a, one of the team members for the radio science experiment. And I'm the, uh, uh, the co-deputy of the, uh, I'm sorry, the co-director of the atmospheres team. Now, this is a mission took a long time to plan. Launched in 2006. Get to Pluto 2015, and we even have plans to go at least five years beyond that. So one of the details of the plan is that we have to build into the team structure remotely. Like the person that was the lead of the atmospheres team when we launched is going to retire. And then I will be the team leader after that happens, soon after we get to Pluto. So it's a very long term mission. It takes a long time, a lot of patience. About nine, eight months before our encounter, we're going to begin our uh, long-range observations of Pluto. About ten weeks before the encounter, we will have images better than anything that we can do with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, four weeks before, we will begin around-the-clock observations of Pluto and Chiron. The closest encounter, uh, Pluto and Chiron, will occur a little over two hours apart. And then we will take about four weeks to just to download the data from that encounter. There's going to be a period of a little bit less than two hours where things are going to be very intense. We have thousands of observations planned in that encounter. And we've been working for years on the details of that planning. Um, <coughs> called the Pluto Encounter Planning <coughs> Team. And I'm on that team too. And we have Basically, it's like a computer program where you program in sequences of events that are going to occur as the spacecraft goes by Pluto. And you can imagine that the variety of different instruments that have different pointing requirements, different sensitivity requirements, you are going to be pointing, so we're going to clicking, pointing, measuring, pointing, clicking, rolling. And this is going to be a very intense period of activity with thousands of events over a period of, of, of about two hours of closest encounter. <coughs> We will fill up a solid state storage device and then send that information back over a period after the encounter. Now, it's not going to take uh, nine months to get the entire, I'm sorry, to, before we will see everything. It'll take about nine months after the encounter before we can get all the information related back to Earth. But there'll be snippets of information that we will get soon after the encounter. Again, it's going to be one of these things you're going to have to have a lot of patience because the image is going to come back slowly. Uh, this is a close-up encounter. Here's Pluto and its moon. New Horizons will fly uh, just inside of the orbit of Chiron, about a 10,000 kilometer distance. It will fly into the shadow of Pluto, and it will fly into the shadow of Chiron. That's built into the timeline. Because one of the things I want to do is do an occultation of the sun. I want to look at how